You're listening to Inside of You with Michael Rosenbaum. Uh, great guest coming up. He's never been on the show. I've worked with him. You know him from Smallville. We'll get into that, but some uh, some important stuff I'd like to share with you. Get a little personal. It's been a crazy week. Uh, my dog, Irv, went to the hospital. Uh, I woke up. He was fine the night before. Um, it was a couple nights ago. Uh, Ryan, you know the story. Yeah. And um, he woke up, and, and he was able to, well, he was limping a little bit and barely moving, and I was like, well, you know, he has leg problems because he's old and all this stuff. So I thought, you know, maybe he slept on it wrong. Certainly I wake up and limp around, stub my toe. Uh, took him up to pee and poop and all that stuff. And then that was, that thus began the downfall. And um, he just lied next to the dining room table. And I was like, something's wrong. It wasn't eating. And then I, I, I put these booties on him, right? So I took off the booty and I know his paw was twice the size of the other. And there was a little pus. And I said, he's got an infection and he felt really warm. And I'm not a doctor, but I was like, I've got to go to the hospital. I called up my friend, Rob. Thankfully it was on a Sunday and um, he raced over. He thought it wasn't going to be a big deal. And then when he saw Irv, I could see the shock on his face because he knew I was freaking out. We carried Irv. He was limp. I'm talking jello. Like this dog was not moving. And I was like, I have to hurry. We carried him to the car. He defecated all over us. I mean, there was shit everywhere. Uh, you know, I did the best I could, but I was on the move. Uh, we'll clean that problem later. Um, we drove to the hospital. And I said, Rob, listen, man, trust me, but I'm good. I'm going through every stoplight. And I went through every stoplight to the hospital, got him there. They came out and I was trying to keep it together. And I was like, keep him awake, keep him awake. His tongue was hanging out of his mouth. I knew like, oh my God, this is, uh, uh, am I going to lose my dog? I, I don't know if I could deal with this right now. Uh, and I took him there and I, you know, you're not supposed to go in the place, but I opened the door. I go, hey, my dog is dying. Can someone please uh, get a stretcher? I really need help. And they raced out there. The people at Access Hospital in Culver City were enormous and uh, put him on a stretcher. And I went in with him, just petting him and saying, hey, buddy, it's all right. Looking at him going, oh, my God, is this the last time I'm going to see my dog? And he went in and I went around the corner where Rob, my friend Rob, wasn't. And I just bawled. I just let it out, man. And I was emotional. I was just really raw emotions. <clears throat> I've had him for a long time. He's the only person I've lived with, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and um, and we stayed there for a couple of hours. And we ordered food in the parking lot. Rob was a good friend, and um, is a good friend. And you know, the doctor called and said, "Hey, his temperature's down a little bit. We're running um, antibiotics through him, fluids through him." And then I finally went home and they said, he's definitely staying the night in the hospital. And I finally get a call and I'm calling them, you know, mm -hmm. incessantly just like, you know, and I mean, that's what you do. I think if, you know, I didn't feel bad about doing it, but, and I wasn't hearing back and I called, you know, cause they were, you know, they're busy. They're, I mean, you've seen other dogs go in there. It's a hospital, you know, things are happening. Yeah. And I'm like, well, either he's just not that bad hoping. And then the doctor called me, um, and said, hey, his temperature's gone down, fluids, he's, he actually went, he stood up and he started slowly getting better. I kept him there for another night, went to see him the next day, kept him there another night, took him home and um, I called Jess, my friend Jess, and Jess came over and she's been helping and just cleaning it, his, his you know, he had an abscess. So if your dog starts crapping or not eating or you feel his head dogs have a higher temperature so his was like a 106 i think and uh man i thought i was gonna lose him so i was i thought i was just gonna get a little emotional talking about this but look the good news is he's 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 much better he's walking around he's taking tons of pills i mean the regimen he's on and then of course little bitch blanche uh, my puppy, she's uh, she's got these bumps on her back. I'm like, what the fuck? And she had an infection. It wasn't like a bad infection, but she had to be on antibiotics. So I took her. So it's just been, I've probably been to 15 to 20 vets, hospitals, PTs in the last three weeks. And, you know, I called my friend Tom and Deneen and they're like, hey, what's up? And I was just like, I'm just, I'm overwhelmed, man. And I never, I usually don't talk about me being overwhelmed unless I'm talking to my listeners or my patrons or you. But it's funny in my personal life, I don't really, it's not that I don't allow. I don't want to burden people. Everyone's going through their own shit, but I was really in a tough place. And um, I'm just I'm just thankful that I have I get to see him again and I get to hang out yeah. with him. And I know he's old. My friend Harlan, funny story. Harlan, you know, from uh, 
Something about Mary. Drinking the Sumpa Grandpa's cough medicine, are you, buddy? Dumb and Dumber. He was on that. Something about Mary. Uh, sorority boys with me. Good friend. And he and every time something happens to her, he always leaves a message. Hey, bud, I'm so sorry. Uh, you know, uh, maybe it's the time to, like, say goodbye, you know, maybe put him to sleep or whatever. I'm like, Harland, he has an infection. Last time, you know, he's he, he went blind. Yeah, maybe it's time. No, it's not. T- so I make this joke now. I, I, I send messages like, hey, Earth stubbed his toe, so I'm thinking about, he's like, <laughs> he's like, hey, buddy, I wasn't. I was just saying, you know, he's old. I'm like, yeah, but just because he's old, you don't, some old guy says, you know, all of a sudden I've got, uh, I fell. You don't put him to sleep. Mm-hmm. Anyway. So I'm sorry, there, man. There, there you have it. Thanks, man. Uh, you're good friends. Everybody, uh, it's too hard. I suggest if anything ever happens to you guys, and inev- inevitably it will, send an email to all your loved ones at the same time and just say, I will keep you updated. I'm not going to respond to messages because it's too much. Yeah. And so I just sent a picture. I sent little things and everybody was really supportive and Irv's doing great. So thanks for every, everybody out there, even fans, my patrons just send in love. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been an emotional time and this, you know, adding the whole pandemic, adding all these things, of course, you know, you don't know how stressed you are and, and fucked up you are effed yeah. up until it hits you and then it hit me. So, um, there you go. I'm glad he's okay. Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, hey, big shout out, guys. Big announcement right now. You're hearing it first. Uh, it's in the trades, but first time I had a chance, Ryan. Uh, Westwood One bought the show. Exciting stuff. We, yeah, man. We've been talking about it for a long time, and I'm, I'm just so pumped that we have a big uh, company that's letting us do our show the way we do it from my home. It, it's like there's no interference other than just incredible support. And uh, there's so many. I wish I could name all of them, but... I'm doing, I'm having meetings now. I never had meetings. It was just like, uh, you know. So uh, it's just, it's really amazing to have someone behind your show that could really um, help you and help the show get out to more listeners and people who might uh, benefit from listening and enjoy it. So I want to say thank you to everybody for attending our Stage It show. Rob and I, if you go to stageit.com, we did two shows on Saturday, online show. It was tremendous. People are amazing. We do Zooms and prizes and it's uh thank you to all the patrons and uh, uh yeah, it's just incredible, and we're making a lot of good music and recording. Is Rob on your shirt? Is that the two you guys? Oh yeah, guitar? this is the uh, new band shirt. They're available at uh, Rosenbaum and Dancing dot com, and go to catalog, and they have women's V necks and all that shit, and men's. Um, I don't want to be that guy that gets a sound. <laughs> I hate that. I don't want to become that guy. Uh, I'll be doing some virtual cons. I just did one. It was really awesome. And so check the Instagram and all that. We do Zooms. And Tom Welling and I from Smallville, we do some Zooms with people. And uh, thanks to all the patrons again for the support and all the amazingness. Uh, right now, this this guest is like, I've been trying to get him. And he's the hardest guest. Oh, there's one other guest on, the, on Smallville that I, I couldn't get. But anyway, it was funny because if you watch, you're, if you're watching this, if you're listening, you should probably watch it too. John's shirtless. And, uh, you know, I really appreciated him being shirtless because he's got a great body. He's, uh, you know, I, when I get to be his age, which is not, you know, not that too far away, uh, but he's working on his, uh, he's got a studio down in Louisiana and, uh, I think it's Louisiana, right? It was Louisiana. Louisiana. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, he's working. So we go a little from location to location cause uh, of sound, but, uh, Ryan here did an incredible job <laughs> piecing it together. And it's really interesting cause he gets personal. Talks about the lawsuit, going to jail, uh, his new studio, his new life, the new love of his life, scares with his his wife with uh, dealing with cancer, but also uh, some fun stuff and a uh, really interesting story. And I really, really, uh, I love you, John. Thanks for opening up and being so sweet. So, you know, I'm from Smallville, Dukes of Hazard, have and have nots. There's just so many things he's done. Let's get inside John Schneider. It's my point of view. You're listening to Inside of You. Michael Rosenbaum. Inside of you with Michael Rosenbaum was not recorded in front of a live studio audience. Where, where, where are you? You're Louisiana? In Louisiana at John Schneider Studios. Um, we have uh, 150 acres or so here. Uh, actually, I don't have it. That's a whole other long story. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, it's a beautiful place. Uh, just, Hey folks, just before we got on the air here, uh, I was showing Michael the pool. This used to be a summer camp, uh, from like 1940 until 1990, it was either a summer camp or a church camp. So it's got this most amazing pool 
it's 200 and something thousand gallons. And uh, when people rent the place to, uh, to shoot movies and do different things, they wind up invariably hanging out at the pool and having a great time. So I showed Michael and he went. <gasps> yeah. And he's also what he's insinuating really is that you're all welcome to come down and hang out in this pool. He'd love that. Well, yeah, you know, we have uh, Airbnb here too. So, you know, you can't come for free, but you can come down and uh, for, you know, a couple of pennies. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll pay whatever money if you promise to have your shirt off if I come there. Ah, I was working. I was working when uh, when this happened. It's either take your call or run to the house and get another shirt. But I figured this would be okay. Look, I said this said before. Be your first uh, shirtless guest. It is. It's the first shirtless guest. And by the way, I got to say, I looked up, you know, obviously, I didn't know how old you are. I never would have thought 60 years old, ever. I don't know how you look this good. I always said this, like, my mom said it, my aunt said it, all my friends said it, like, he's really hot. When we were doing Smallville, and I'm like, okay, thanks. All right, well, I'll thank you. I don't know what to say, but I'll tell him. Oh, thank you. Thanks. But thank you. Uh, I'm happy. You are happy. And by the way, someone who has like, you know, I know you're writing a book. I know you're doing all these. I mean, you've done everything. I, we, we'll get into that. But the, the, Dude, I wrote the book. I wrote the book. The book is out. The book is the book's out. out now. My Life, My Way. Yeah, it's out now. My Life, My Way. Get it on Amazon. Why not? Do you tell all the truths? No, the next one. I, I tell the truth, yeah. But I get the next one is called uh, uh, Naked. So the next one will be, uh, there'll be a little bit more... Uh, uh darker in depth as far as into the dark stuff you know because i'm uh i write dark things so uh when uh when naked comes out there'll be a little more uh the first one is absolutely true but the first one is like um pg you know so that people will go oh that's cool i didn't know that oh i didn't know you know the divorce is in there losing the studios and all that stuff is in there but it's it's uh it's more with the smile. Uh, it's more of a uh, light at the end of the tunnel. And then the second one is going to be a little bit of, of, of finding out that the light at the end of the tunnel is attached to the front of a train. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. But, you know, like you, you look at a lot of actors and people think, oh, look at them. They're successful. I bet they were popular in high school. I bet they had it all. They just always have been lucky and talented and they have whatever it is. And so, like, on my podcast, I like to find out things that sort of make people human, make people, uh, others relate, and say, oh, wow, he suffered from it. And you think, oh, John Schneider. I mean, obviously, we've had some hardships, which we can get into. But you, when you were in high school, you were you were overweight, to say the least, right? I was the fat kid. Yeah, I was the, uh, if, if I was in, if I was a character in Sandlot, it would be the fat kid with the inhaler. You know? You had an inhaler. I had an inhaler, primatine mist. I remember it well. I was, you know, the last guy kind of chugging along at track and field. You had to take track in New York. I'm from New York, New York State. Right. But um, yeah, there was there was something though, Michael. When I when I uh, I used to go to the movies uh, every Saturday, um, and I would I would go to a double feature, and I would sit there, and it. I don't know how to describe the difference. I get into this in, in my life, my way, but I would look up there and go, not that's, gee, that's where I want to be, but I'd look up there and go, that's where I'm supposed to be. That's, that's where I'm going to be. Um, but it wasn't like wishful thinking. There was something, something in me from about eight years old on that said, this is what you were built to do. This, this is why you are here. Um, so I never, when, when, uh, when kids would, uh, pick on me and, you know, push me, uh, they did, they, they used to do this wonderful thing in New York where one guy would get your attention and the other guy would get on his hands and knees behind you. And then they would, they would tip you over into a pile of dog shit. That was, that was, that was fun stuff they did in oh, New York boy. state. Um, so when things like that would happen, I would, I would think, well, it's all right. That's okay. You know. They probably picked on John Wayne because his name was Marion. <laughs> his name was Mary? Marion John Wayne. Marion Michael Morrison. So um, there, was, there was never a point. Now, granted, Dukes of Hazard happened when I was 18, but it happened when I was 18 because I'd already done 10 years of theater. Um, I was already on the, on the path. I was already Projectory. pretty much unstoppable. Um, 
which is why I walked into the audition for Dukes with a six pack of beer. And I, I gave them what I thought they wanted. And I was right. So what um, beer was it, John? Pabst Blue Ribbon. PBR. Pabst, do you remember uh, what was it? Uh, the uh, David Lynch movie. He was like, Heineken. Fuck that shit. Pabst Blue Ribbon. PBR, baby. Yeah. What was that? Uh, um, David Lynch Blue was Velvet. Uh, Blue Velvet. Blue Velvet. You're right. What can I say? So, John. I mean, you're, you're overweight, you're 250 pounds, people are making fun of you, but you see something that no one else sees. You see almost, I guess, your future in a way, right? Yeah, well, it was, um, when I was a kid, I loved the television show, I loved the television show uh, Lost in Space. Right. And I had a weird dream that they were shooting Lost in Space at my dad's upholstery shop. And I was like 10. So I didn't have a dream that I was in, you know, on the Jupiter two with the Robinson family. I had a dream they were filming at my dad's shop and there was, uh, there were lights and there was the clapperboard and all that, but there was, there was craft service. How in the world would I know there was such thing as craft service on a television show set? I was going to make a fat joke, but I'm not going to do it. Yeah. 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 About craft service. Yeah. But Hey, Hey Hollywood. But, um, <laughs> They were there, and I was sitting talking with uh, with Billy Mummy, or Mummy, I'm not sure. Uh, Mo- yeah. And we were just, we were pals. It, I wasn't with Will Robinson, so it was weird. I had a couple of things like that happen in my, uh, in my life. Later on, I, I, I ran into June Lockhart, who was in the dream, too. Had a weird dream that uh, I was at a party in a tuxedo, and I bumped into somebody, and I said, oh, excuse me. The guy turned around, it was Dean Martin. And Dean Martin, also in a tuxedo like he always was, said to me, thanks for having me here. And I'm like 11 years old, right? And uh, years later, during uh, one of the the last Children's Miracle Network we did at Videopolis out at Disneyland there, um, I I was wearing my tuxedo and I bumped into a a gentleman. I said, oh, excuse me turned around it's dean martin and he says thanks for having me here so when opportunities come around like dukes of hazard when opportunities come around like smallville which i said no emphatically i said i don't want to be part of the demise of the superman legend i don't want to have anything to do with smallville you really turned it just turned it down three times wow i turned down the audition i said i'm not going to go audition i'm not going to take the no and then uh then they said, just read the pilot. My, my agent said, read the pilot. And I got to the part where, uh, where uh, I have the keys to the truck that you gave, uh, you gave Clark on right. the wall. And I, I said, um, he said, so you're saying the apple doesn't fall far from the tree? And I said, no. I said, I just want you to realize where the money came from that bought that truck. And at that point, I knew that... that uh, this was not going to be the demise of Superman. This was going to be something that would firmly plant Superman into the psyche of, of watchers forever. That it, in fact, would be the best part of the Superman legend. Um, and at that point, I, I, it wasn't like, oh, gosh, I, I want to be Jonathan Kent. It was like, oh, this is the next thing. This is the next stepping stone for me um so i didn't have any doubt in the world that i was going to get it even though there were there were other people there and i i I, and somehow michael somehow this is not uh it's not arrogance it's like seeing it when i was 18 and i read dukes of hazard i thought oh this is it this is the springboard, what I've been working toward. Uh, gosh, it's hard to explain. No, no, I absolutely understand it. Listen to me. There are some people who think, and you know, I think I've been both these people, that you're like, this is me, this is the role, I'm getting this role. And then there are a lot of people who think, oh my gosh, but they're going to go out to somebody else. There's going to be so many other people. Be, you know, you start thinking, there's a certain confidence, and I think s- certain... Um, inadvertent i don't know if it's inadvertent but it's 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 this brave sort of intuition or feeling you get when you're younger and you're like excited about something i remember in college saying to alexis combs i remember her name sitting on the porch and i go i'm gonna go to new york and i'm gonna make it and she's like oh okay 
She didn't talk like that. She was way smarter than me. I don't know why I made it. I just, I try to differentiate my voice. She was just like, okay, oh, great, Michael. That's great. And, and by the way, uh, we, we've texted in the, in the last six months. And, um, but I said, no, 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 I'm going to New York. I know the odds. I know all that stuff. It, it, it doesn't, it's not, that's not about me. I know what I'm going to do. So there was a certain, and I go, remember this moment. Because you're going to go, oh my God, I remember him saying that because I felt it. It was just something I felt. So I understand that you had this feeling that this is going to happen. Yeah. Well, you know, you have to, um, they say that success is when preparation meets opportunity. Right. But there's another part to that. Um, I know a lot of very talented people that, that throw opportunity away with both hands because they don't recognize it. You've got to recognize, you have to expect great things. If you don't expect great things, if you look at you look at life like, ah, fuck, what's going to happen now? Nothing is going to happen now. Certainly nothing good. But if you look at life like, you know, I, get, I get like a little kid. There's an Easter egg. You know, where's, where's the Easter egg? I know there's an Easter egg out here because, because they're supposed to be. So if you look at life that way, then you start recognizing the Easter eggs and you start realizing what you have prepared for. So prep uh, success is when preparation meets opportunity that you recognize uh, and you recognize it when you expect it. So um, when I first saw this property where, where the studio is now, I came in and it was like, I saw, I saw nothing but opportunity here. I saw, my God, I can, we can shoot this. We can shoot that. We can film here. We can build a barn. We can put on a play. We've done all those corny things. You saw it. That, yeah. That, 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 that 13 year olds want to do when they, uh, when they get together and they're going to do the odd couple, you know, let's do a, let's do a play that we only have, uh, we only have one room. So they go and they do the odd couple. Right. And, uh, that's, that's what I live here every day. Alicia and I have made 11 movies, Michael, 11. We've been together. It'll be six years in October. And, wow. uh, we've made 11 films. When I saw you in the, uh, at the good neighbor, I have to plug them because it's my favorite little breakfast place in the world in uh, Studio City, sort of North Hollywood. I saw you there, and it's the first time I'd seen you in a long time. You were sitting there with her. I remember you looked at me, and you go, I'm really happy. And it made me so, just, I felt so warm inside. I, I just felt so good that you felt that way, and I could see it. And, um, you know, when you just said you, you are happy, I, I, I could see that. There's something about you that it's not saying that you weren't necessarily happy in the past when I saw you, but now when I, there's a certain glow where I think, I think you said this on the phone when we were, when I was trying to get you to do this podcast and you said something like, uh, she lets me be me. I could be myself. So it was something along those lines, right? Yeah. Well, and also, you know, uh, uh, one of the greatest lines of dialogue ever was uh, she makes me want to be a better man. <laughs> right. Hey, let me ask you. What? When you, I mean, look, you go from a kid who's, uh, you know, an overweight kid who, uh, you know, suddenly gets this confidence. Uh, supposedly I read about, is it true that your, your brother, you, you found a hundred bucks under a video game and you took that and you went to the gym with it. Is that true? I did. Yeah, I did. But Hey, I got to back you up a little bit. Cause, um, even when I was a the fat kid, I still had the confidence, you know? So it was, uh, an unusual combination. I had the, uh, Denver Pyle said, uh, I had the strength of my ignorance, <laughs> you know, I, I didn't know it was impossible. So I did it. I think it's important. It's like, it's nice to see that you sort of knew who you were then in a way, you know, where I I'm still figuring it out, but like, you were like, I don't care. And that's what I like to say. Uh, you know, I've have a family members or friends that, you know, are overweight or, or don't like this about themselves. I don't like things about myself, but I'm like, just learn to love yourself. I mean, that's what we have to all do. And you, it seems like you had confidence in yourself and you loved yourself and you were ready to go to the next level. Well, I believe, Michael, that we're here for some reason. You know, we aren't just, we aren't just around. Uh, we aren't just taking up space. Um, that there is something we're supposed to do. Everybody, not just me, not just you, but everybody. And I think my grandmother put that, instilled that into me. Um, and that's a, lo a lot of that. I think I passed on in a very real sense to in, in Smallville, Jonathan to Clark, you know, you're here for something. Um, so do it. 
so you're you're not here to be a, a failure. You're not here to be a uh, a problem. You're here to do something good for someone else. And I knew that. So as a as a kid, I knew well. Yeah, I'm overweight, and I I did have to make a decision, which my brother helped me make. Uh, my brother one day after my like third slice of pizza at Six Flags said. So I guess you've just forgotten all about that movie star thing, huh? And I said, hmm, what do you mean? And he said, well, how many fat movie stars do you know? And at that point, all I could think of was Zero Mostel. And I, I knew I wasn't made to be Zero Mostel. Jo- John Candy, John Belushi? Well, not at that point. This was, uh, I don't know, I don't think uh, had Saturday Night Live happened in 76, 75. Sure. Maybe. I think so. So I... When you're on a path and you hear somebody tell you the truth that will steer you in the right direction, uh, you recognize it. Again, that's that opportunity, recognizing that opportunity. So I had the opportunity to either continue eating the pizza or stop because he was right. Uh, But who I was up to that point was the fat kid who made up for not being able to run in track by having a guitar on my back and playing music for everybody all the time in high school. So I wasn't an unpopular guy. I was kind of that guy with the guitar that would, would sing those Jim Croce songs. Um, but that stopped. As soon as my brother said that, that stopped. The next day, we were at a bowling alley and I was playing the, uh, an Evil Knievel pinball machine I dropped a quarter, I crawled underneath the machine to get the quarter, and I found a $100 bill across the street. It sounds like, it sounds like fiction. Across the street from the bowling alley was a big sign. Nautilus had just opened up, the first Nautilus, I think, anywhere. And it was three years for $100. So I, that night, I asked my mom, you know, what should I do? And she said, well, if you're really going to do this movie star thing, then you should spend your hundred dollars. So I did, I spent my hundred dollars and uh, two months later I was, uh, 185 pounds and looked great, uh, because I'd spent two months dieting and working out at Nautilus. Uh, the next, uh, couple of months later, I was one of the hardest trainers at Nautilus there in Sandy Springs. So it's, it's, this is like, this is a movie, the first act. This is the first act where the kid goes and he picks up the quarter and he sees a hundred dollar bill and his boo's like, I don't know, what should I do with it? Well, you want to be a movie star, don't you? He's like, well, yeah, but I could buy a lot of pizza and a lot of other cool things with this. It's like, okay, I guess you're not going to be a movie star. And then he looks across the street and there's a freaking gym and for three years and the kid goes there, which most kids won't ever go. They won't do that. I wouldn't have done that. I would have taken the hundred bucks and I would have bought a ColecoVision. I would have bought whatever. And, and I just, I, I, I don't have that. You, that's amazing. I remember when you first got Smallville. Well, when I first got, when we first got Smallville, I had, it sounds fancy, but it wasn't $5,000 Cadillac Eldorado uh, convertible that didn't run very well. It looked good, but it was a piece of shit. I bought it for five grand and you let me keep it at your mansion. If I may say, uh, in Agora Hills. I lost it. Don't, don't let him kid you. I lost it, folks. I lost it. But you had one. That's more than... I had a jet, too. I lost that, too. All right. Well, you know, we could talk about that. But right now, I'm talking about my shitty Eldorado Cadillac convertible, John. Love your Eldorado. It was like from Smoking the Bandit. Yeah, and I remember you came over one day. You had... I don't, I don't know if you had any more, but you had the General Lee in your garage. Yeah, I do. I have, I have two of them now. Okay. So I go... Can I see it? And you're like, yeah. And I was kind of nervous asking you. And you're like... Let's go for a ride. And we got in. Of course, I jumped through the window. It was hard because I just had surgery a few years back, so I was a little stiff. But we drove down the highway, and we got looks. And the girls, I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm in the General Lee. Some people that were younger were like, what the hell are these guys doing? But it was my brother. I got my brother. It was before FaceTime. He was like, no way. It was so exciting. But you're so giving. You're so good to me. You eventually said, come get your piece of shit. I can't keep it here anymore. But I, it was after about a year or two, and I understood that. But, you know, those days, did you have a great time doing the show? Did you love doing the show? Did you, uh, I mean, I, I could tell that you were just really enveloped sort of in the in the role, and you took it so seriously, which I think really helped the character and the show. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I have, uh, I have, you know, it's been a long time. So I have, I have great 
great memories. Uh, another part of me remembers, though, being kind of pissy about scripts or about uh, the shallowness of uh, of the writing at times. But, you know, now I realize, you know, it's hard. It's hard to turn out 24 stories worth watching a year. It's yeah. hard to do that. So, yeah. uh, but I didn't, I didn't really know. Uh, and I just uh, did a YouTube video. Um, I do, I answer Duke's questions and people always ask me my favorite episode. And somebody said, what is your least favorite episode? And I had to tell them that when we did it, we did one called the ghost of general Lee. And I remember reading it and thinking, oh, great. Now we're stealing from Mark Twain. This is Tom Sawyer. We show up at our own wake. I mean, these guys are so lame. Years later, it became my favorite episode. Wow. So once I became a member of the audience, rather than a member of the cast, I loved every minute of Dukes. Um, but I'd be lying if I didn't say I didn't piss and moan a little bit during our, during our seven years. I think we all did. Look, I mean, you're you're caught up in it. You're tired. You're working, and I think everybody did such a fantastic job that we we're always pushing each other in different ways. And so, you, you know, you always want the this to be better, that to be better, and nothing's perfect. So you do the best you can. And of course, I look now, and I'm like, to write twenty two, twenty four episode one hours a year. How could how could more than half of them even be good? It's so hard that you hope you have a but hand. But you know, yeah. I work now. I've worked now for the last. Seven, eight, seven years, eight years. Anyway, with Tyler Perry. Tyler turns out 22, 24 episodes of the Haves and Have Nots a year, 24 episodes of six other shows a year. Somehow he manages to, uh, to write them and direct them. And, and uh, it's called Speed. Speed. The hardest and easiest schedule I've ever had is doing the Haves and Have Nots. We have shot, we shoot between 100 and 140 pages a day. Screw that. I wouldn't do it. I'd fall apart. I can't memorize. I need, I need a week to do five pages. Yeah, well, guess I won't see you on the set. Well, you know, by the way, my mother said, wow, he just plays a real evil character on that have and have nots. Wow, he's so dark. And I'm like, did you do that purposely? Like, I think as actors, sometimes we're like going, we're, we're playing such a, a nice, you know, a, a genuinely innately good person on Smallville. And then all of a sudden you just, you want to turn it around and say, Hey, look at me. I could do something different. Was there part of that? Well, again, there was uh, after Smallville, there was, uh, I did a, a wheel on Nip Tuck. Yep. Uh, and then I did a show called Dirty Sexy Money. Oh yeah. Then I did, I did an episode of Leverage, which was great. So all of a sudden, Again, recognizing opportunities, all of a sudden these characters started to change a little bit. Well, quite a bit for me, but these darker things started coming in. So when the haves and have nots, when I read that and I had to read for it, you read by, uh, by uh, invitation for Tyler. Um, I read it. And again, I said, oh, there it is. There's the next one. And uh, so I went in and I, I was like, this is mine. I don't know. I don't know why anybody else is, is here. Uh, maybe they didn't have anything to do today, but this is mine. <laughs> <laughs> Months later, when I had kind of forgotten about the whole thing, I got the call that, that yeah, we're going to do this show and uh, you're going to Atlanta and it's going to be great. So, um, and it's been, it's been wonderful. But again, that was that thing that I recognized and said, oh, you know, again, I'm a 13 year old. Oh, there it is. There's the next stepping stone. Do you ever get nervous? Do you ever get nervous while you're acting? Do you ever get nervous about, and by the way, who helps you learn lines? You learn them quickly. How do you do that? I learn them quickly. I, I don't get nervous anymore. I, I really, you know, Michael, I, I don't get nervous. <laughs> Why? What's the secret? Um, knowing that the part is yours. I remember I did a thing. Uh, I went and read for Rob Reiner or something. And it was, I thought, oh, this is great. This is, this is me. It was a lot like Smallville, though. And, it, and there were dark things coming. But dark things coming. That's a good that's title. A title yeah. um, but I read for Rob Reiner and uh, found out a couple of days later that somebody else got it. And my first thought, and this is not my New York sarcasm, my first thought was, wow, I thought Reiner was smarter than that. I, you know what? I know John Schneider enough to say I could have told you you'd say that. 
<laughs> you're definitely one where it's it's you know, I like it. It's an ego, but it's like you know you believe so much in yourself that you're like, eh, wrong decision. I know what I can, uh, and it's not even what I can do. I know what I can bring, and what I bring is believability. So if you want if you want people to believe the shit that you wrote then you've got to have someone who can convince people the shit that you wrote is real. I'm that guy. I'll note that. I I tell, I've, I've taught a couple of acting classes when people, when the teachers couldn't be there. And I say, we're throwing out all this Chekhov and Shakespeare and we're, we're no Neil Simon, for God's sake, we're not going to do Neil Simon because Neil Simon is brilliant. The chance that you will ever have the opportunity to be the first person to utter a line the likes of which Neil Simon wrote is slim to none. However, your job is to make atrocious dialogue believable. So let's find some atrocious dialogue and make it believable. Yeah. That's what I teach. Or do it the best you can. I've, I've had some atrocious dialogue in my time. And, uh, you know, I remember being on a show where even my own family was like, wow, that's bad. And I'm like, what? Oh my God, my own family. I'm like, and I'm trying to like, I'm at night. I'm like, what can I do? You can't do anything. You just can't do, you just can do your best. It's a 20 watt bulb. It's a 20 watt bulb. You can't make it burn at 60. You just Mm. can't. You can make it the best finely polished turd (laughs) that you can. Inside of you is brought to you by Hydrant. Summer's here, guys, and I'm always dehydrated. I never drink enough water, Ryan. It's crazy freaking hot outside. I know, and I decided to wear pants. That was a bad idea. Bad idea, man. I'm always wearing shorts, and I'm still dehydrated. It's terrible. But I, I started taking these powders, these electrolyte powders by Hydrant. Look, we all know that we have to drink more water, but by the time you feel thirsty, it's too late. You're already dehydrated. You can't focus. You feel tired, and it's critical. It's critical to drink more water. Hydrant has created a refreshing electrolyte powder that you mix directly into water to more efficiently and effectively hydrate your body. It hydrates you quickly and keeps you going for longer. It helps me. I'm older. I need this stuff. I need to keep going. And I forget, like on this podcast, I talked to somebody for an hour and a half. Hydrant. Mm Got to hydrate myself. And what I love is it's backed by research. It's not just another product. Hydrant is a formula that was created, developed by an Oxford scientist. It also is loved by pro athletes, celebrities, top performers, and has thousands of five-star reviews. It's made with real fruit juice powder, delicious, refreshing, comes in a variety of flavors, including new summer-friendly iced tea lemonade and fruit punch. Mm. Those happen to be my favorites. Oh. And uh, tell them about our special deal, Ryan. We've got a special deal for listeners to save 25% off their first order. Go to drinkhydrant.com slash inside or enter the promo code inside at checkout. That's D-R-I-N-K-H-Y-D-R-A-N-T dot com slash inside and enter promo code inside for 25% off your first order. Drinkhydrant.com slash inside. Enter the promo code inside to save 25%. And we thank them for sponsoring our podcast. Thank you, Hydrant. Inside of you is brought to you by Lucy. I needed this company to come along. I'm so glad it did. Lucy Nicotine is a company founded by Caltech scientists and former smokers looking for a better and cleaner nicotine alternative. Finally, tobacco alternatives that don't suck. Research for three years developed for people, not patients. Lucy has created a nicotine gum with four milligrams of nicotine that comes in three flavors, wintergreen, cinnamon, pomegranate, Lucy has a lozenge with four milligrams of nicotine and cherry ice flavor, if that's what you prefer. Ryan, how about yourself? You're not a smoker. I'm not. No, I just <laughs> I just end up having to cut out a lot of your hacks and wheezes on the podcast. But now. not anymore. Not anymore. Not with these lozenges. That's exactly This is good right. for me, too. Thank you. You've helped Ryan, Lucy. <laughs> it's 2020. Get off your cigarettes. Unplug your vape. Throw away your dip. That's what we call it, dip in the Midwest. Uh. Get some Lucy nicotine gum or lozenges. This is the real deal. A subscription to Lucy comes directly to your door each month. It's so simple, and you don't have to leave your house because Lucy has delivery down. Listeners, go to lucy.co and use promo code INSIDE to get 20% off all products, including gum or lozenges. That's lucy.co and use promo code INSIDE at checkout. Also, I have to give this disclaimer. Warning, this product contains nicotine derived from tobacco. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Lucy.co and be sure to use that promo code inside. 
Inside of You is brought to you by Quip. I love these toothbrushes. They're they're good looking. They work so well. They're easy to travel with. They're reasonably priced. I mean, these electric toothbrushes, man, they cost you a fortune, and then you get stopped at security in the airplane. They're like, what's in the airplane? That's my toothbrush. You know what I mean? <laughs> Does that happen? It has happened. I have a big toothbrush thing, but not anymore because I have Quip. Smart electric toothbrushes have all the guiding features of our original brush with a new Bluetooth smart motor that connects to the free Quip app so you can track your brushing. You can get tips and daily coaching and earn rewards for good habits like brushing two minutes twice a day. And the Quip brushes are for kids or adults, so you have both. Earn daily points for brushing two minutes twice a day. Earn bonus points for challenges like streaks. It's just pretty much amazing. They're pretty much saying brush your teeth and get rewarded for it. Quip's got all sorts of features, a built-in two-minute timer. It pulses every 30 seconds to remind you to switch sides and help you clean your whole mouth effectively, evenly. Kids' electric toothbrush is just like our original, but with size-down features. Um, Anti-cavity toothpaste and a mint or watermelon flavor. And uh, tooth-strengthening fluoride. Plus, you can get brush heads, toothpaste, and floss refills delivered from $5, and shipping is free. How smart is that? Join over 5 million mouths who use Quip and save hundreds compared to other Bluetooth brushes when you get a Quip smart brush for just $45. Start getting rewards for brushing your teeth today and go to getquip.com slash you right now to get your first refill free. That's your first refill free at getquip.com slash you. Spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash Y-O-U. Quip. Better oral health made simple and rewarding. What's the hardest thing you've gone through in your life? I mean, I, obviously a lot, but what's the one that just resonates at the hardest moment in your life where it was just, uh, you thought, you know, and I don't know what you thought, if you can get through this or. Well, when my smile, when Alicia, uh, a year and a half ago now, was diagnosed with stage four uh, breast cancer. Oh. oh, I'm sorry. Now she's clean. She's clean. We attack that. That's just a, the most amazing thing about Alicia. We are so similar. And yet we are, we, we, we both come to this relationship, this marriage with, with a full toolbox, full of tools, but neither one of us have the same tools. Cause I like to say if, if, uh, if, if two of us are the same, then one of us is unnecessary. So when a, when a person in a white coat told us that she was three years into a five-year shelf life uh, and her PET scan lit up like a Christmas tree, we both, and, and hear this folks, we both looked at each other and said, no, we have things to do, not only individually, but together. We have a tremendous amount of things to, to do. This is not going to happen to us. We are going to figure out everything that cancer wants and stop it. We are going to find out everything that cancer hates and do it. And we did. And now she has a clear PET scan and she, cancer is, by the way, cancer is not something you beat. Cancer is something, uh, I know this because I'm the, the founder of the co-founder of Children's Miracle Network. Cancer is something we all have but we also all have a system that is built to fight it, to keep it at bay. It's like oil and water, you know, it's gotta, you've gotta keep it at bay. So when somebody in a white coat tells you you have cancer, what they really are saying is your cancer has gotten stronger and your system that fights it has gotten weaker or has given up. So you have got to, weaken the cancer while strengthening that system. How do you do that? Well, you do it with diet. You do it with, I mean, people say cancer can't live in a, uh, in a alkal in, in alkalinity. So drink alkaline water. Well, yeah, do that. <clears throat> cancer can't live in heat. So get a, uh, every opportunity do infrared, get into an infrared, uh, sauna. Infrared saunas go up to 158 degrees. I have one of those. Cancer loves sugar. When you get a PET scan, they will give you a thing called glucose so that they can see where the cancer is. Why? Because cancer attracts glucose. 
So stop eating sugar. It's not a matter of choice. It's a matter of, it's a matter of absolutely a matter of life and death. Uh, there's something about CBD oil that helps. I don't think it fights cancer, but I think it takes your system that is there to fight cancer and gives it something it can recognize. Mm-hmm. And that system goes, oh, thank God you're here. Where you been? And it enables that system to get stronger. It enables, I believe, it enables the medicine that the doctors will give you to work better. So the second that person in a white coat walks in and says these things, your mind, you don't, I mean, do you get emotional? Do you start going, oh, what? or do you just turn? Yeah, I mean, I can't even think about it without, without getting, because I, I mean, I was there. And um, Alicia puts it this way. She said, for, for the first couple of days, let the house be on fire. You know, you woke up in the middle of the night and there's, there's flames out in the hallway and there's no way to get out except jump out the window and it's three stories. Okay, we'll live that way for a couple of days. Don't, don't deny yourself the cleansing of panic but don't live there. You can't live there. It, it almost sounds like she's consoling you in a way. She's like saying, hey, this is like, almost she's like, she was, I don't know, there's, a, there's this inner strength where I, I think I would just fall apart. I wouldn't, and she's like, hey, this is, it's almost like you guys jumped into a plan. Like, we've got to get this. Let's grieve. Let's. We panicked. We panicked and, and uh, you know, uh, all these, all these long-term goals. I couldn't look at it. Couldn't look at a tree. I couldn't look at a flower. I couldn't look at anything without wondering if she was going to be here Ugh. to, cause we plant, we do a lot of plantings and things, plant, plantings, planting. And uh, yeah, gardening is great for the soul. Um, so everything made me sad for a little while. Uh, nothing made me mad. You can't get mad because if you realize cancer is something we all have, just some of us, have stopped fighting it for some reason. Well, figure that reason out and fix it. So, so that was hard, but we were strong together before, you know, now, I mean, we're Johnny and June. <laughs> it was on last night. I watched uh, walking Phoenix. That it, it just came on. I was like, Oh, oh look at that. You know, and I remember when you, um, when your dad passed, and I remember you made a, vi- there was a, like a video because you, I don't know if you're on a photo shoot. I can't remember exactly, but I remember how emotional it was. And, it, but you wanted, you wanted to remember it. So you filmed it. How had that go? Well, we were doing a press shoot for haves and have nots. And during lunch, I had, I, my dad was, had had a stroke and he was in bad shape and uh, he passed away during lunch. And I had a couple of more setups to do. And when they had said, this was, uh, this is your last one. So when, I said, let me know when you, when you take the last picture. He said, oh, don't worry, I'll get you out of here. I said, it's not about that. Just let me know. And um, he said, okay, all right. That was it. And I said, come here, take my picture. And he said, no, we're done. I said, no, 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 just take my picture and I'll tell you why. And he took this series of like 38 ching, 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 ching pictures. And then I told him, I said, I learned during lunch that my father had passed away and I wanted for some reason, it was almost like, you know, God said, capture that moment. Mm. And I did. And later that, that gentleman asked if he could publish those pictures and I saw them and they were, they were, you can't act that. Um, and I said, absolutely, you know, go ahead. Because uh, I believe that when you see, again, like you don't deny yourself panic, don't deny yourself grief. So that was on display. And somewhere during the next year, that photographer's, he was doing a shoot and he found out that his brother had died. And he turned to his assistant, handed him the camera and said, take my picture. What? Oh my God. And I have, I have the pictures just from my cell phone uh, within three minutes of finding out my mother had passed away. And there's, there's something healing about 
those pictures. And I'm not sure what it is. But uh, if you have that opportunity, it's not a selfish thing. It's not a narcissistic thing. Capture that moment. So here's why. I'm just figuring this out. So you can always remember how much you love them. I just thought that. Because I think sometimes when you lose something and, you know, someone passes or this, you're like, you know, I should be, you know, did I grieve long enough? Did I, you know, and you start to question things like, why didn't I? And it's, it's a moment like that that makes you realize, look, you absolutely love this person. I can look at those pictures on my phone. And they're not for anybody else. They're just for me. Um, but it's a, it's a good idea. It's a good thing to do. Uh, it'll, it'll uh, yeah, like you said, like we said, it'll keep you, it'll, it'll remind you how much you love them. Um, speaking of which, you care if I play this little song? It's my favorite song. It's, it was a number one hit that you did. Oh, sure. Sure. It's your Do you need a love like this? Oh, that when, when you played that for me and on uh, Smallville, I go, holy shit, this guy does it all. <laughs> uh, all right. This is called Shit Talking with John Schneider, my patrons who I love, who support the show so much. These are some questions from them. So this is rapid fire. You don't have to sit here and dive deep if you don't want to. Uh, Steph A, were you offended by the Dukes of Hazzard with film with Jessica Simpson or did you like it? Uh, I thought it would have to be considerably better to suck. There you go. Thank you. Nancy D, you've had such a varied and lengthy career. How have you stayed so grounded with such incredible credits on your resume? Because I know I'm not, uh, I know I'm not there yet. Um, I, can, I can see the finish line from here, but in many regards, I feel, and this is, uh, I mean this, I feel like I'm, I've just started. Wow. You have that attitude, man. You have to have that attitude. It's not like athletics. You know, somebody is faster than somebody else. Somebody throws a ball faster than somebody else. Somebody hits a puck more accurately than somebody else. With us, it's all relative. It's all speculation. So you've got to have your own unit of measure. And uh, I've hit a couple of triples, but I haven't hit the grand slam yet. But I will. I love the attitude. Carly H., how difficult was it playing Jonathan Kent when you knew there was a time limit on his involvement in the show, and did this affect the choices you made in playing him? Uh, the, way I, the way I played Jonathan Kent was mostly affected by the fact that my son, a uh, real son, uh, had, has Asperger's syndrome. So um, I chose to treat Chasen as if he was someone who had special gifts, not special needs. And we talked about that on Smallville a lot because we had to forget that this boy was going to be Superman because Superman didn't exist yet. Wow. So, uh, so there. My death, my impending death never even occurred to me. All right. Anna A., what prompted you to found, co-found the Children's Miracle Network? How much are you still active with the organization? Uh, I'm still very active with Children's Miracle Network, although we're doing things uh, in cyber land like, like this now. But um, when I was a kid, when I was a fat kid, I had asthma, I had an inhaler. I spent a lot of time uh, in hospitals being poked and prodded. When Dukes of Hazard happened and I became, on, I was on the number one show in a three network world, um, I felt the need to do something so that children wouldn't have to go through what I went through when I was a kid. And that's how Children's Miracle Network was, was birthed. Really? Well, makes perfect sense. Uh, Jennifer Ann, she grew up watching Dukes of Hazard and loves the song, Good Old Boys. What is your favorite episode in the show? I think you said that. Yeah, my favorite, well, I'll tell you, my favorite episode is Ghost of General Lee. However, I had so much fun doing Carnival Thrills, also doing Go West Young Dukes, because I, I got to have a mustache and a bull whip and a, you know, <laughs> a gun. I didn't have to carry a bow and arrow in my pocket. It's kind of hard to carry a bow and arrow in my pocket. So th those would be my top three. Lisa H., what was more brutal on you mentally, starring in a weekly TV show or your stint on Dancing with the Stars? My stint on Dancing with the Stars is the single most difficult thing I have ever done in my life. And I've been on Broadway. I've played music for 120,000 people. I've done all these television shows, but Dancing with the Stars kicked my ass. All right. Hey, I wanted to ask you, you know, I never got... I think I'm asking you not because... 
it was a terrible time in your life, but maybe it's selfish of me to ask this because it's always scared me. But you you had to go to jail for a couple of days, right? Well, I was supposed to go for three, but the jail was full. So I went for nine hours. Nine hours. Well, but there's an important, an important thing to know there. Okay. I went for three. And when you go in, you go in. When you're processed into the Twin Towers in L.A., you're processed into the Twin Towers in L.A. You are, make no mistake, you are in jail. And I was fully believing I was going to be there for three solid days because that's what my ex-wife's uh, lawyer made sure that the judge checked some box. Um, so in my mind, I was there for three days. I was shocked. Uh, and, you know, oddly enough, Michael, if you'll believe this. I don't think anybody else will believe it. I was looking forward to the research I was going to be doing for three days in jail. And when they let me out, I was like, wait a minute, are you, are you sure? I mean, do I have to come back? No, no, no. You, you, you're out. You, you, you came. You had every intention of doing your three days. There's no room. So you're, they're, they're letting you out. You weren't nervous at all. You aren't, you, you honestly, when you first went in there, I was like, nervous in court because in, in court, I said earlier, I don't get nervous. Well, I got nervous in court because I realized that this judge, for whatever reason, um, didn't like me and really, I don't know if he had a relationship with the, with my, my wife's, uh, counsel or what, but he, they would do the most atrocious things and say the worst, the terrible things. And he would just sit there and listen. And I, I would say something in defense of myself. And I was treated like uh, I was treated terribly. So I was treated in jail much better than I was treated in court. In court, I was treated like I was guilty until proven innocent. Wow. So whatever anybody, you know, when somebody says, you know, I was framed and they did that, believe them. Because I found no justice whatsoever in the court in Los Angeles at 111 High Street. No justice whatsoever. You know me, Michael. I'm an, I'm, I mean, I will try to do the right thing. But when you push me to a certain point, especially when you call me a liar, my God. So I asked when it was all when it was all over, he gave me a date. I had to report to jail by a certain certain time. And I said, Your Honor, I, I want to get this behind me. Can you just send me now? He said, what? I said, you told me before that, you know, if, if I didn't show up, you're going to track me down and have a bench warrant for me and throw me in jail. Well, it can't be that difficult. So just send me now. I want to get this over with. I want to start my three days as soon as I get out of here. I want to walk to jail and get this over with. What did he say? He said, um, bailiff, can we do that? <laughs> no one's ever said it. This guy's lost his mind. No, no one's ever done that before. And this is a guy who threatened to throw me in, you know, come across the state, come across the country and throw me in jail. So he had a sense of humor about it. And I went to jail and they weren't ready for me. I had to ask. I had to beg. I said, look, I got the paperwork here. I said, I love the show. I said, which one? <laughs> but uh, I, had to, I had to request that the, the, uh, the deputies call the court and figure out how to admit me into jail. And they did. And they said, OK, well, come on in. And took the shoelaces, took the belt, took, I mean, did the whole thing. And I was, you know, waiting for an orange jumpsuit. Right. And uh, wound up being let go right and if you guys don't know the story obviously this is taken out of context but it was like you know uh obviously you know you have you know the story your your whole ranch your movie studio was completely like trashed right from the for hurricanes oh, it was during that time yeah where i'm standing right now yeah the water water was this high you really can't get much of a of a picture of that here right but everything i had in the world uh was destroyed 2000 what is today on august 13th 2016. And we had just had in March, we had had the 100 year flood. So we lost a lot of things in March, but it was nothing compared to what happened in August. And so that's pretty much why you're saying you were you were you had no money to give or you would have given it. Well, I had nothing. My tax returns proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that I had lost almost a half a million dollars in 2016. Okay. 
the lawyers on the other side talked to the, the I had the, the third time I had to bring the, the CPA out who prepared my tax returns. And I thought it was all going to be over at that point. Well, here are the tax returns. They're tax returns. They're undeniable. Well, she said to the, uh, to the CPA, excuse me, did you prepare, the, you prepare the tax returns? She said, yes. She said, and the receipts that the tax returns were prepared from, did you compile those yourself? And she said, well, no. And she said, it's here, say, your honor. And my piece of shit lawyer didn't say, just a moment, your honor, may I, may I uh, uh, cross-examine, may I say, say, all he had to do was say, do you know the person who prepared the receipts? And she would have said, known her all my life or known her for 20 years. He didn't do it. Wow. So the judge said, and this is why I, this is why I have bad feelings toward you, judge. He said, people lie on their taxes all the time. Sustain. At that moment, my tax returns proving I didn't have two nickels to rub together were inadmissible. And I now was a guy who had millions of dollars who would not pay it. And that's why I went to jail. You, it, what a story. I can't wait to read the next book. Well, but I put it in a script. I put, I put a lot of that in a script. You know, you, there's a, as, a, as the, uh, the optimist said, looking at a pile of shit, he said, you know, there's a pony in there somewhere. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Michael. I, dude, listen. I love you. I mean, I, I, I'm amazed. You're so open and so honest and so sincere. And I love hearing all these stories. And I mean, we talk about your success and the, it's amazing what, when people listen, you know, a lot of these stories, it, you know, I think it gives them hope and, and you opening up about your wife and, and the cancer is just inspirational. And hey, uh, let me throw one more thing at you, Michael. I think sure. this is important. Um, all this, my life has been great. I love, I love every minute, even the bad stuff. And here's why. <clears throat> if you know you're a hockey player, if you have the puck and nobody's on your ass, then you're not a threat. So if you don't have problems like this, if you don't have a judge to look at and go, am I speaking some language you don't understand? If you don't have those things to me, those things that try to stop me, let me know that I am indeed on the right track. If I didn't have those things, I would question whether or not whether or not I was on the right track. So if there's somebody out there right now who just uh, just gets piled on them, don't let that weaken you. Let that give you strength to get through it because there's something up there around that next corner that somebody doesn't want you to see. Go for it with everything you've got. I love it. Hey. This is awesome. I'm glad we finally found an area where you, where I could see you and I could hear Allie you. Alaga. Allie Alaga. I'm going to come down and visit that place. It looks great. Please do. You love it, Michael. You'd love it. This has been real nice. To, uh, t it's been amazing to catch up. Bring your dreams and bring them here and get them, uh, get them, uh, put some light on them. I will, Johnny. Good talking to you. Yeah. Love you, Michael. The one thing you got to love about John is he says what he wants to say and what he feels. He doesn't uh, kind of like people will call me and say, cut that, do this. He's like, air, I want you to air this. I want you to air this. The judge was an idiot, you know, and uh, it's just, you know, he just kind of, what's the saying? You uh, go by your own tune of your horn. You can go your own Well, that way. too, but you go no. the, old, the beat of your own drum to beat your own bongos man whatever <laughs> i'm never meant for uh clever things uh, i want to say thanks again to everybody listening and keep listening is big announcement with westwood one which is incredible they bought the show and they're so amazing over there they're really rocking it everybody over there thank you i have sales meetings now and i have meetings about the show and the guests and it was just me and Bryce and Ryan going, "Hey, I'm interviewing him." Okay, let's do it, <laughs> and which is great. But now, I hopefully this is this is definitely the next level. They're a big company, and they really support the podcast. And I and I really want to give a shout out again to to Westwood One for supporting us and and believing in us. And uh, thank you. Also, support the podcast. Follow us. Subscribe. It helps so much. We're really getting more subscriptions. And if you like this guest, you know, stick around. Um, the handles are at inside of you podcast on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter is at inside of you pod. Um, so it really, really helps. 
I told you about the virtuals. Make sure you watch the virtual uh, cons. We do Q and A's. We do duo uh, zooms. Me and Tom and single zooms with me. And you know, you only get a certain amount of time. But I'm always pressing the more time button for people. And they're like Rosenbaum. We got to move on. I go. I don't know, but these people are they're paying for a Zoom. I want to you know give them a little bit, talk to them, and so check those out. And uh, yeah, I'm on the cameo. I think that's it. Let me uh, uh, shout out to all my shout outs. The uh, the patrons, of course, can't forget the most important. Nancy D, Mary B, Leah S, Trisha F, Sarah V, Little Lisa, Yukiko, Jill E, Brian H, Brian, Lauren G, Nico P, Barry I, Angelina G, Robin S, Jerry W, just heard from Jerry W, hi Jerry, he cameoed me, Emily K, Bob B, Robert B, Jason W, Stephen J, Kristen K, Amelia O, Allison L, Tom N, Jess J, Lucas M, Raj, Everybody knows Raj, Joshua D, Emily S, CJP, Samantha M, Hamza B. So easy to say that, Hamza. Jennifer N, Stacy B, Carly T, Jennifer S, Janelle B, Tabitha 272, Kimberly E, Crystal H, Mika E. I'm sorry, Mike E, Mike E, Marissa N, Nani Delo, Ramira, Beth B, Chris F, Chad W, Lee M, P, Jackie P, Rodrigo S, Rachel, Ray A, Maya P, Megan D, Jennifer C, Maddie S, Tiffany I, Kendrick F, Ashley E, Margie M, Thomas T, Matt W, Belinda N, Benjamin R, Lisa J, Kevin V, Robert S, Joy W, Nicole M, Amber F, James R, Chris H, Snow R, Snow, Noah K, and Sean V. Those are the patrons. Giving extra support to the podcast, and uh, I love it. So, hey, guys, be safe out there. Love your dogs. Love your family. Give them a call, text. It's so easy to say I love you. You never know what's going to happen. Um, and we got a lot of great guests coming up. So please stick around. Uh, all my love. Thanks to Ryan here. Thanks to Bryce. Thanks to uh, Westwood One and everyone else. Uh, thank you for allowing me to get inside each and every one of you. Until next time. Mm -hmm.